Let's open our Bibles to the Gospel of John, the 21st chapter. John chapter 21, on Sunday mornings we've been going through the Gospel of John, and we've come to this final chapter, the 21st chapter. We'll begin reading in a moment here in verse 15, John chapter 21. I hope you've enjoyed the series. I have. Uh, I've learned a lot, and uh, it's been challenging. It's been a wonderful time. Let's stand if you're able to stand. If not, you can remain seated. We'll begin reading in verse 15 of John chapter 21. Let's read together every other verse you read. I'll read 15, you read 16. We'll read it together. We'll go down to verse 19. Notice the Bible says, So when they had dined, Jesus saith to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs together. He saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved because he said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus saith unto him, Feed my sheep. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, When thou wast young, thou girdest thyself, and walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee, and carry thee whether thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. I'm glad he said that. That helps me understand that verse. And when he had spoken this, he saith unto him, Follow me. We'll stop there and let's pray. Father, we thank you for this day. It's a joy to be in your house today. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here, the ability to be here. And Lord, we've come here because we believe we ought to be here. And we trust that you want to speak to us through your word. So Lord, as I preach, I pray a fresh filling of thy spirit. Lead and direct my thoughts and my words. And I pray that your word this morning would have free course. Lord, Lord, help us to anticipate the fact that you want to speak to us as individuals today. So may we be mindful of your voice today. Please bless the message. I do pray if there's someone here today that's not saved, that today would be the day they come to know Christ as Savior. But for, the, for those of us that know you as Savior, I pray, Lord, you to work in our hearts and help us to understand this wonderful, wonderful, yet vital truth of the Christian life today. We ask your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. It was not long before what we just read here a few moments ago that the Lord Jesus Christ had come to this earth and accomplished what he came to this earth to do. Not long before here. In other words, not long ago from what we just read, Jesus Christ had just gone to the cross of Calvary. That's what he came here to do, and all God's people said amen. Yes, he was an example, a great example. Yes, he came to preach. Uh, yes, he came to perform miracles, but that was not his primary reason. His primary reason to come to this earth was to die to die for the sins of mankind, to pay for your sin debt and my sin debt in full, and to make salvation available to all who believe. Peter put it well when he penned that epistle in 1 Peter 3.18, where we read, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. That's why he did it so that you and I could get to heaven, that we could get to God. Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he, God, uh, God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Aren't you glad if you're saved today, you are seen as righteous before God? Gone, 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 all my sins are gone. Praise God for that. After the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross of Calvary, Joseph and Nicodemus pulled down his body off that cross, and they took the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they placed it in that garden tomb, laid it there, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, to lie there 
for three days. But we know because of what the Lord Jesus Christ says and the, said and the scriptures teach that his body did not stay in that grave. He did not remain dead as he promised, as the scripture promised. Three days later, the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead, alive forevermore. Amen. And that very morning, the Lord began to show himself to his disciples. After that Sabbath, Saturday, that Sunday morning, the three days were up. Uh, we know that Mary Magdalene was the first one to come to that tomb. And she saw, she was the very first one to see the risen Lord Jesus Christ there that Sunday morning. Then Mary of Bethany and the other women who were shortly behind Jesus Christ appeared to them as well. Then thirdly, he appeared to Peter somewhere privately. Then fourthly, that afternoon, uh, he appeared to those two disciples uh, recorded on Luke 24 on the road to Emmaus. They saw him as well. And then that same evening, that same Lord's Day evening, that Sunday evening, while they, the disciples were in that upper room, a ten of them without Thomas, Jesus Christ appeared to them as well. Then eight days later, we know Christ comes again and he appears to his disciples in that upper room recorded for us in John chapter 20 and verse 24 through 29. And it's interesting because when we read the last two verses of the Gospel of John in verse, uh, chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, I'll read them here in a moment. It almost seems, if you just read it, it almost seems to me at least as if the book of John is going to conclude. Like that's the end. Look at the verses, verse 30. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. I believe that would have been an appropriate ending, but God didn't. He wanted to uh, continue. Why is that? Because the Lord uh, was not finished yet. He had uh, two more things that he wanted to do. Two more things that he wanted us to know about. The first one is recorded when we dealt with this last week in the beginning portion of the Gospel of John. He wanted to teach his disciples uh, uh, that, uh, a lesson. And then secondly, what we're going to deal with this morning uh, is he's going to deal with Peter individually. More to do, and they're recorded for us in John chapter 21. You see, when the chapter begins, uh, seven of his disciples return to Galilee. They went home. They returned to their fishing business. Understand, the events that took place the last few days, a few uh, weeks or so, all took place in Jerusalem. Now it's over. They go back to uh, Galilee, and Peter announces as seven of them are there around the Sea of Galilee. G Peter announces, I go a fishing. And we read that the other six of them followed. We understand from the context what he meant by that. Peter meant this, I'm going back to my old life. I'm going back to fishing. I'm going back to the business. I'm going to back to doing what I did before. And the other six followed. And that night, we know what happened. They went fishing all night. And what did they catch? Absolutely nothing. And when they come back and return that morning, they see someone there standing on the shore. They don't know who it is at first. And that person that they, that's there, we know it's the Lord Jesus Christ. But that person that's there, ask him, children, have ye any meat? The question fishermen that catch nothing love. Did you catch anything? And of course, I would imagine they kind of sheepishly or hanging their head responded to the Lord by saying, no. And then Jesus tells them to cast their nets uh, uh, into the sea on uh, the side of their boat. Uh, boat. And when they do, uh, they bring in this great harvest of fish. It's an amazing thing. 153 of them to be exact, according to verse 11. And it all clicks in when this happens. Uh, it matches a miracle that Jesus performed in Luke chapter 5. Uh, and John connects the dots. And John says, it is the Lord. Peter recognizes it as well, and he jumps out of the boat, and he starts swimming to shore to get to the Lord. 
And they all gather on the shore there, and they recognize it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And they bring those fish in, and they begin to do what all good Baptists do. Eat. They begin to dine. But now the Lord's going to do something else. While that lesson was a lesson to remind them of what they were left here to do, that they're not here to uh, fish for fish, but God left them here uh, to fish for men, uh, there was one more thing the Lord had to take care of before this book ends, and that's Peter. He's got something he wants to do to deal with Peter. And as we read through this interaction with Peter and the Lord Jesus Christ, Peter is going to experience something that I would say is wonderful between him and the Lord. And that is this. Restoration. Peter is going to experience here the restoration of God. He is going to be restored to fellowship with the Lord. This morning I want to preach on that very subject. My title this morning is The Restoration of a Child of God. You know, all of us at one time or another need to be restored to God. Oh, can I say that again? Please come off your high spiritual horse this morning and stop shining your halo. Every one of us, this preacher included, at one time or another, every one of us needs to be restored to God. You know the word restore is found in 66 verses of the Bible. Maybe a coincidence, I don't know. But that's the number of man, six, is it not? But perhaps one of the most familiar verses is found in that familiar psalm, Psalm 23. We quote it often, but often we breeze over this idea of restoration. You could say it with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lay down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Here it is. He restoreth my soul. He not only saves us, he is our shepherd that died on the cross for us on Calvary, but also as a child of God, one of the things that he does for all of us is he restores our soul. Our God is in the restoration business, and I'm so grateful for that. You know, the word restore means this. It means to thoroughly repair. You ever have a relationship that wasn't what it ought to be? All of us have. This is a rep repairing of that. It, it means to make amends. It, it means to join back together. It means to mend perfectly. The Greek word is a word katartizo, which means this, out of Galatians 6.1. It's actually a medical term. The Greek word was often used uh, in medical situations. Uh, and it means this, to join back a dislocation. In other words, something that has been dislocated and you bring it back, join it back together, that has the idea of being restored. The same could be said about a, a broken bone. When you break a bone and it mends back together, that is the same idea. Uh, the mending process, that restoration. And I'll say it again, at some time and to some degree, all of us need that. We all do. Because our fellowship uh, will be, need to be thoroughly repaired with God, joined back together, made amends. Uh, and think about this, our God, our God in heaven, the great creator, the holy God, uh, he does restoration for all of us. He desires to restore us. He's looking to restore us. But here's a great question this morning. Do we desire to be restored? You see, the problem's not on his end. The problem's on our end. We need to want restoration. Let's go ahead back to this story here in John chapter 21 and consider some things as, as the Lord is working in Peter's heart to restore him. Notice, first of all, number one, the condition of Peter. What condition was Peter in? You say, well, he was, he was pretty strong. I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about spiritually. Where was Peter at this exact place? Uh, uh, I would say two things uh, if I were to give comment about Peter's uh, condition here. I would say two things about it. Number one, I would say this. Peter was in the family of God. 
Pe Peter, in other words, what I'm trying to say here is Peter, there's no doubt in my mind, right here, Peter was a saved man. And we know that because we find his salvation experience recorded for us back in John chapter 1. Would you turn there, please, with me? John chapter 1. As a means of reminder, John chapter 1. And let's look at verse 40. For time's sake, we'll, we'll go there. Notice, one of the two which heard John speak, talking about John the Baptist, Baptist and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, uh, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. So understand, uh, uh, Andrew heard John the Baptist preaching. Uh, he heard about Christ, uh, and Andrew believed on the Lord. And the first thing Andrew wanted to do was to do what all of us want to do, tell our relatives. We want to tell them how to be saved, how they can know their sins are forgiven, how they can know they have a home in heaven. And so Andrew runs back and he goes and he finds his brother. His brother's name is Simon Peter. And he says to him, Simon, Peter, we have found the Messiah. And it was at this time uh, that Peter came to know the Lord. My point is this, is that Peter was a saved man. He was born again. He had trusted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. You know, we go further down into the epistles of Peter, 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, and his wording proves it. Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith. He had, the, he had faith in Christ. He was trusting not in his works, not in his church, uh, uh, not in his good deeds. Uh, he was trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ alone for his soul's salvation. And he calls it a like precious faith as he speaks to fellow believers. He, reads in, uh, he writes in 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Notice he uses the phrase born again. He's saying he was born again. Jesus Christ said himself in John chapter 3, in verse 3 and 7, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know, before I was saved, I thought that phrase, I didn't know a whole lot about the Bible and, and Christianity, but I, did, I heard that phrase somewhere along the line of being born again. And if you were to ask me, what's it, what's, what's, what's it mean to be born again? I'd say, well, that's one of those religious, religious fanatics. That's what I thought. Somebody went around saying the sky's falling and get right with God and that sort of thing. And, and, and that's what I thought. That's what I thought it was. And now I've become one. By that I mean I've been born again. The idea is that we have a natural birth into this world, a, a physical birth uh, through our mother's womb. That's the first birth. Uh, but you cannot get to heaven on just one birth. You need two. You need a second birth. And that is a spiritual birth. And Christ said what it meant in John chapter 3, a little bit later down the chapter. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Therefore, if you accept and believe on him, you have been born again. You're born into the family of God. Peter was saved. You ask Peter, Peter, do you know you're saved? You know the Lord? Oh, oh, yes, I do. I hope this morning you're saved. You say, well, I'm in church. I understand that. Doesn't mean you're saved. You have to trust the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Do you know him? Are you in the family of God? If not, you can get that taken care of today. At the end of the service, we'll have someone take a Bible and show you how to be saved. We're talking about Peter's condition, though. And the first thing is that he's in the family of God. But I'd describe it a second way as well. Not only was Peter in the family of God, Peter was also out of fellowship with God. You say, preacher, it's possible to be in the family of God and be out of fellowship with God? Of course. Just read the book of 1 Corinthians. They were saved. Man, they were carnal. They were backbiters. They were, had cliques in the, in the church and everything. You say, well, they must not have been saved. Read chapter 1. They were saved. But they were out of fellowship with God. You know, I, we are of the conviction here, and I believe we can prove it easily biblically, that the Bible is very clear that a believer can never lose their salvation. No matter what I do, I can't lose it. I didn't earn it, so I can't lose it. It's not based on me. I don't keep it based on me. It's based on what the Lord Jesus Christ did for me on the cross of Calvary. 
If someone is truly saved, there's nothing that he or she can do to get himself or herself unsaved, if that's a word. I just invented it, if not. Nothing you can do. John chapter 10, my sheep hear my voice, Jesus said, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. That sounds like eternal security to me. John 6, 37, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. Eternally secure. So a child of God can never be removed from the family of God. But a child of God can be out of fellowship with God. This is where Peter was. And this is where we are often. Can I ask you something? You're saved. Are you in fellowship with God? Can I just put it in the, in the preacher way? Are you right with God? Are you? P -p Peter, you say, you say, well, how do I know? Let me see if I can explain it. We're out of fellowship with God. Maybe, maybe this might make it a little clear for all of us. When we, ha when we have known, unconfessed, undealt with sin in our lives. It's that simple. When I'm living a life and I know I'm doing wrong, I know I'm doing things that, I sh that are contrary uh, to the Word of God, or that I've done things that are contrary to the Word of God, or I'm not doing things that I should be doing, and I'm living my own way, doing my own thing, and, and I don't come and get right with God about that, do you know I am not in fellowship with God? Now we can walk around like we are, but we're not. You see, it's when we refuse, and this is where we get so hard-hearted, when we refuse to exercise the simple truth of 1 John 1, 9, it's not that hard. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That uh, word confess is a Greek word, homo legeo, which means this. I'm not trying to impress you. I'm just trying to give you the understanding. It means to say the same thing. In other words, when we say the same thing about our sin that God says about it and admit to it and we ask forgiveness, he'll forgive us no matter what it is. It's when we don't say the same thing. Well, it wasn't that bad. Well, it was just a little thing. Then we need restoration. You know, one example of someone that was out of fellowship with God, perhaps maybe the most familiar one in the Bible, was King David. Do you remember when King David sinned against, uh, against God with Bathsheba? You know the deal. He sent, didn't go out to battle, and he sent uh, Uriah out there, Bathsheba's husband. And, and of course, while she's gone, uh, he spies her, uh, spies her on the roof, uh, uh, bathing, calls her over, and he commits adultery with her. Then on top of that, he does all those other things to, to try and cover it up, and he thought he had it covered. And imagine for at least nine months, David was walking around the kingdom as the king, functioning as the king, every day doing his thing, and he was out of fellowship with God. He wasn't right with God. He was hiding it. So what did God do? He sent Nathan the prophet, gave him that little parable about the sheep and one man having a little sheep. You know the story. And when Nathan looks at David, he says, Thou art the man. And David was crushed. It finally, he finally realized, I need to get right with God about this. And we know that David uh, repented and he tried to uh, get right. He went to God about it. We read of his confession, his, uh, the first John 1, 9 of the Old Testament is Psalm 51. And we read David saying this in the midst of his confession. Listen to the word. And restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. All along David was ruling the kingdom, uh, but inside he was empty. Inside he knew he wasn't right. Inside it was there. He had no joy in his heart, but he was playing it right as if he did, undetected by people, and that's where most of us live. But he wasn't right with the Lord. Notice he says, restore unto me the joy of my salvation, not restore unto me thy salvation. 
He didn't lose his salvation. He lost his joy. That's where Peter was. You say, how so? <laughs> you know, Peter, throughout his life as a believer, Peter did and said some, some, can I just use this phrase for lack of a better phrase? He did some pretty dumb things. He said some pretty dumb things. By the way, I'm with Peter there. I do some pretty dumb things. I say some pretty dumb things as well. But Peter, more so than any of the other disciples, I heard one preacher say this. He said, Peter had to use a lot of foot mints. <laughs> I think I, I get what he was trying to say. But you remember on the Mount of Transfiguration when Peter was there and, and John in that inner circle and here come, the Lord was praying and the Lord gets transfigured and, and appearing on that Mount of Transfiguration comes Moses and, and, and Elijah. And of course, what does Peter say in Matthew 17, 4? Let's make three tabernacles, one for Jesus, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. And he gets rebuked by God. God returns by saying out of the heavens, This is my beloved Son. Hear ye Him. And the others disappeared, and finally they saw no one but Jesus there. It was Peter that said that. Do you remember when Christ was walking on the water in Matthew chapter 14? Uh, and here he comes. And at first, uh, uh, the disciples were afraid. They, they thought they saw a spirit. And of course, uh, Peter speaks up and he says, Lord, if it be thou, bid me to come unto thee on the water. Hey, I'll, I'll go out there on the water. And of course, Christ bids him. And as he starts walking, he begins to sink because of a lack of faith. Christ says to him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Then when Christ said later in another place, uh, in Matthew 16, I believe it is, uh, Christ was telling them after Peter's confession, a kind of a weird spot for this to happen, but he was telling him how he was going uh, uh, to die uh, for mankind's sin. And Peter speaks up and he says this, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. You know what Peter say? This ain't going to happen on my watch. <laughs> not while I'm here. Then, of course, we know what happened. Of course, Christ rebukes him, saying this, Get thee behind me, Satan. Now, a lot of names I don't mind being called. Well, some I do, but that one especially I wouldn't like. Get thee behind me, Satan. That's what Christ said to him. Thou art an offense unto me. Should I go on? I think I'm making my point about Peter. Uh, when, how about the upper room? We could talk about that. When, when uh, Christ was doing the disciples and he, and he came to Peter, Peter says, Oh, you don't have to do mine. Mine are fine. Christ said, no. We're doing yours too. You need a washing. And then we'll do my body as well. He didn't get it. We could talk about the Garden of Gethsemane when, when they came to arrest Christ. Who was it that pulled out the sword and, and sliced off Malchus's ear? It was Peter. Peter was strong-willed. He was self-willed. Peter was self-confident. Peter was prideful. Peter's mouth often worked faster than his brain. He liked to talk more than he liked to listen. Sounds like us, doesn't it? This caused him to do and say some pretty dumb things. But it was the one thing I'm going to talk about here that perhaps the Lord wanted to deal with that Peter recently did. You know what it is. When he denied Christ. Uh, you, you, you remember that evening. You remember when Christ was in the upper room just moments before the Garden of Gethsemane and they're there meeting. Uh, John chapters 13, 14, uh, 15, and 16. Uh, we find Christ uh, speaking to them uh, and Christ says he's going to go to the cross again. And Peter, here he goes again. Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. He goes on to say this. Though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. That would have been pretty hard for me if I was in that room, knowing what I know happened to not go. <laughs> because moments later, he did exactly what the Lord said he was going to do. Could you put yourself in Peter's shoes for a moment? Three and a half years with the Lord. Three and a half years of statements of he, he's going to be the, the one. Uh, nobody's going to mess with my Lord. 
And then that evening when, they're t when he's taken away and he's out there outside of that trial room there and he's warming his hands by the fire, standing afar off with the unbelievers there, and uh, someone looks up and says, Hey, 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 I know you. You're one of them. You were with them. I was not. Oh. Then another one. No, that, that, that's him. I never knew him. Then another one. I don't know him. And he began to curse. Can you imagine that? And the moment he did that, the cock crew, and he looked over, and at that very moment, walking out of Pilate's hall was the Lord Jesus Christ who went and looked at Peter right in the eye after he said those words. Peter absolutely melted. Imagine this big, that's just my thought of a big fisherman. I just think of Peter as this big guy with these big fishing hands with the nets and the calluses on them. The guy who thought he could do everything. Can you see this big burly man after his eyes met the Lord Jesus Christ sitting there? The Bible says he wept bitterly, just sobbing. What did I do? That's why he was out of fellowship with the Lord. Because he never, ever addressed it. Never dealt with it. Can I ask you something? How about you and me? Are you in fellowship with him? Oh, you had a fellowship with him. Well, I never denied the Lord publicly. Maybe not. I'm not at the bar last night or Friday night. Maybe not. How'd you talk to your spouse? How'd you talk to your children? How'd you do with people this week? You see, often we think the, the ones that need to get back in fellowship with the Lord, the, the ones that, that need restoration, are those that are carousing the town. You know, the prodigal son type people. And I'm not one of those. Maybe not. But there's more to it than that. It's the small foxes that spoil the vine, the Bible says. And we need to get right with God no matter what degree or level of sin we've committed to get back in fellowship with Him. Do you need restoration? You can get it today. Peter did. So we see, number one, the, the condition of Peter. Notice, secondly, back to our text, notice the questions to Peter. So the Lord knows his condition. He, has, he knows it. He knows what Peter's at. He knows what happened. He looked him in the eye. He's God. He knows everything. And he wants Peter to be restored. I remind us this morning, if you're here today and there's something in your life or something in my life that's not where it ought to be, that God wants you to be restored. He's holding his hands out to be restored. He's, he, come, come, be restored. That, that's what he wants. And that's what he wanted with Peter. We know that he wanted it with Peter specifically because it's interesting what Christ told his disciples. What, actually, what he told the women when he, uh, the resurrection appearance, when he saw them, he told them to tell the disciples to go meet him back in Galilee, which is where this story is taking place. But I want you to notice how he said it. We won't go there for time's sake. Mark 16, 7. He says, but go your way. Tell the disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall ye see him as he said unto you. They said, I believe it was actually the angels there. But it, it was. It, it, I got a message for, for, for the disciples. Go tell the disciples. Oh, by the way, and Peter. And why would he say that? Because I'm sure if that message came back to the disciples and Peter was there and he said, go tell the disciples, he probably thought this, that's not me because I think I disqualified myself. You don't know what I did. I, I, I said I didn't know him. He, there's no way he wants me to be an apostle. No way. Must be you guys. Let me know how the meeting goes. And, and if he asks for me, then I'll come. He didn't, he didn't say the disciples. He said, go get the disciples and Peter. Bring them to Galilee. You know why? Because of what we're reading here. 
He wanted Peter to be restored, and he wants you and me to be restored. So notice Peter, uh, Jesus asked Peter a question. You say, a question? It's actually three. It is, but it's basically the same question. Now, we could get into the Greek words. We could get into the first time he added a few words. I'm not going to deal with that yet, but I'm going to deal with the content of it. Uh, notice the question he asks in verse 15. He says to Peter, he calls him over, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And, of course, he answers with, uh, he says, well, yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. Jesus responds, feed my lambs. Then in first, verse 16, he says again, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, feed my sheep. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Can you imagine being Peter? Now, I'm just taking the human side of this. But you want to say, I just answered you. I just said it. Peter's grieved, the Bible says, was grieved because he said to him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said to him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou, thou lowest I love thee. Jesus said unto him, Feed my sheep. Why, why, why did he do it this way? Why did Christ ask Peter that way and that many times? Is there a significance? Well, yeah. Everything God puts in the Bible is significant. Now, 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 I believe that the question, and I'll treat it as one, asked three times, uh, but the question was designed to do three things. Don't miss it. Number one was this, to bring a realization to Peter. You see, the Lord wanted to restore Peter. He desired to destroy, uh, restore, destroy, restore Peter. He said, bring him up. I need to talk to Peter. And he had that desire here. But here's what has to happen. Peter first had to realize that he needed restoration. Peter had to realize his condition. Uh, you see, the first step in restoration is admitting that you and I are away from God. That's not always easy. So when Christ speaks to him, he calls him this. Simon, son of Jonas. Notice he says it all three times. Simon, son of Jonas. You know, it's been a long time since Peter was called that name by Christ. A long time. Do you know immediately after Peter got saved, and I didn't read the verse in John 1, because for time's sake, I didn't, I'll read it now. Christ said to him this, John 1, 42, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. You see, the, he said, okay, Simon, son of Jonas, your name is now Cephas. And do you know from that time forward, Jesus Christ called him Cephas? When he addressed him? He did. But now, he's reverting to his old name, the name he was called before he was saved, Simon, son of Jonas. You know what he's saying to him here? You're acting like you were, like you acted before you were saved. You say, how do you get, that's not too far of a stretch. Just stay with me here. Didn't God do that with Jacob? Uh, he renamed him Israel, didn't he? Jacob was born the supplanter, the trickster. He lived his life tricking people. But when he finally got right with God, God said, you, you, I'm not going to call you Jacob anymore. I'm not going to call you Israel, which means I believe it's a, a soldier for God. But if you follow that name through the book of Genesis, you'll find that every time uh, Jacob got in the flesh, every time he made a carnal decision, God stopped calling him uh, Israel and he called him Jacob again. And then when he gets back to being right with God, now he addresses him as Israel again. Same thing here. It was Cephas, Cephas the whole time. Now he says, Simon, son of Jonas. He's reminding him of what he was. I have a brother. I'm the fourth. I'm the youngest out of four children in my family. I'm the baby. And I'm still the baby. Even though I don't look like a baby. You know, <laughs> far from it, you know. But I'm the youngest. My brother's oldest name is Ken. Love my brother. He's a great, great man. We call him Ken. Do you know when we were growing up what we call him? Kenny. You know, kids in the neighborhood call him Kenny. 
Hey, Kenny. That's what it was, Kenny. People do that with names when they're kids sometimes. And some carry it over. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But sometimes, you know, it's Kenny, and it's Ken is Kenny, and Bill is Billy, you know, little boy, Billy, and so forth. Again, if you still use that, there's nothing. That's not wrong. But it identifies. But you know, if I were to, if I were to uh, walk up to my brother and said, hey, Kenny, he'd go, huh? He'd say this, I'm not a kid anymore. That's what they called me when I was a kid. It's the same idea. This was a name, and, and, and I believe Peter understood that. He used that name because it, it, it was a, it was a, a, a realization uh, to him that you're acting like the old man. You're in the state of carnality, if you will. So he asks a question to bring that realization. There's a second reason, real quick. He asks a question to be a reminder to Peter. Why three times? Why three times? He, he's trying to be a reminder of some characteristic of people. Why do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Why again and again? Now some have said because, you know, Peter denied Christ three times and this was giving Peter an opportunity to say he loved Christ three times as a, ma as a means of res uh, restoration. Now that may be true, I don't know, but I think, there's, I think there's something perhaps a little more on the surface and simple. I think he was trying to remind Peter something. You see, Peter had a bad habit of saying things he didn't mean. Peter talked before he listened. Every husband understands this. Your wife says something to you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Honey, could you take out the trash or something? I'm doing something. Yeah, I'll take out the trash. Honey, honey could you take out the trash? Yeah, 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 I'll get to it. Honey... Could you take out the trash? Now, my wife doesn't do that. I read about it in books, and some of you guys told me about what your wife does to you, so I'm using that as an example. But anyway, uh, could you take out the trash? Uh, she's trying to get it into my thick skull that this is something I need to get. Same with Peter. Peter, love a salmi? Yeah, 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 you know I love you. Peter, love a salmi? Yes, yes, yes. Peter, Peter, lovest thou me? Think about what you're saying. I think the third time, it finally, it finally hit him. But you know what? I have a bad habit here of saying things and not meaning them. And, and I understand what he's saying. So finally, it got through. And that's what that question was designed to do. Again, to bring a realization that Peter was acting like the old man. To bring a reminder to Peter uh, that he had to, what he was really saying here. And then thirdly is this, to bear the root of Peter's problem. What was Peter's problem? Uh, Christ is trying to show through that question the root problem... What is it that gets us out of fellowship with God? You say, well, my spouse. <laughs> my kids. I used, to be, I, I used to be a good Christian until I had kids. <laughs> now I'm really struggling. That's not the real problem. We could blame all sorts of things. Uh, you see, the very reason, don't miss this here, this is it, and we're getting near the end here, so don't, don't worry. But uh, the very reason we get out of fellowship with the Lord is because our love for Him has waned. That's why church is so important. I come in here sometimes, and i got things on my mind. You do too. And you come in, and we sing, Isn't the love of Jesus something wonderful? And you start thinking, Yeah, wow, it is wonderful. You know what it does? It brings our minds, it renews our minds back to where it's supposed to be. And it brings us back to the cross to remember what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. And understand, the root of being away from God is our lack of love for Him. Revelation 2, 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. That's the church at Ephesus he's talking to. They had all these works. They were doing all kinds of things. They were serving the Lord. They could tell Sue was a true apostle and a false apostle. But he said, you're missing something. You lost your first love. And that's what I think the way we all function, most of us today. We walk around. We're not, we're not, we're, our hearts are away from the Lord. We need restoration. We've done things we haven't dealt with, and we're just walking around, and we're serving. We're running buses. We're teaching Sunday school. We're saying amen. We're singing the hymns. But we're not right with him because we've left our first love. It's a heart problem. You know, our love wanes when we forget what he's done for us. Paul said, for the love of Christ 
constrain offense. I won't go there for time's sake, but read Luke chapter 7 where the woman came in to the Pharisees, into the home, and she, she wiped Jesus' feet with her hair and the ointment and, and so forth. And Christ gave an example there. He said, the one that, that is forgiven most loves me the most. The truth of the matter is all of us have been forgiven. We just don't think we need it as, needed it as much as some other people. And it's a heart issue. It's a heart problem. And that's what Pete and Christ is trying to, to remind us. You see, we like to blame everything else uh, for our problems. We'll blame the pastor or the staff because of some decision that was made or something you didn't like or something that wasn't done the way you felt like. Well, I don't like the color of these chairs. And I want it blue. And people get out of joint. We blame our spouses, as I said, our children. We'll blame other family members why we're not living the Christian life right. Other church members that have offended us. After all, they took our chair. <laughs> or our parking space. I didn't realize we had a sign parking space. It was just saying. Well, they said something. They, they didn't shake my hand right. Or they looked at me a funny way. Or on and on we go. And we use those things. At, by the way, if you're looking for an excuse uh, to get out of church, you're going to find one. Because we're a bunch of imperfect people that have been saved by the grace of God. They're just trying to live the Christian life. And we are going to, uh, somewhere along the line, get offended. Great peace have they which love thy law. And nothing shall offend them, the Bible says. We cannot blame anyone else for the fact we're not right with the Lord. And Peter is brought, brought to himself there, which brings me to number three, and we're done. The condition of Peter, the question of Peter, then lastly, the restoration of Peter. Peter's response the third time convinced the Lord that Peter did indeed love him, that Peter indeed wanted to serve him, that Peter wanted his heart right, he wanted to get it right, he wanted his life right. Peter was restored. It's interesting how the metaphor changed. It changed from before of you're going to be fishers of men. Now he's saying another level he wants for Peter, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Talking about those that are saved. Do you know when Peter, after Peter was restored, Peter went on to do great things for God. I mean, just read through the Bible. If you read through the book of Acts, you'd, you'd find that it was Peter that gathered them in that disciple meeting there in Acts chapter 1, and they had to replace a, 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 a Judas, and they, they voted for Matthias. Uh, if you remember when they all got, it was Peter that led that meeting. When, the, when they were waiting, and then the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2, and they burst out of there. Who was it that preached that message uh, that captured 3,000 people's hearts, uh, and they got saved? and baptized and added to the church, Peter. Who was it that after the lame man was healed in Acts chapter 3 and there was that dispute and Peter comes out, he starts preaching again and as a result of his preaching, 5,000 more get saved. On and on. Peter was used of God to pen two New Testament epistles, obviously, uh, First and Second Peter, and, and Peter would even give, end up giving his life for the cause of Christ. That's what we read in our text, verse 18 and 19. This spake he, signifying by, signifying by what death he should glorify God. I want you to think about this. The one who fell farther than any of the others that were there walking with Christ would be used greater than any of the others. The others kind of fall off the scene. I know Paul's later. We could talk about him. But the others, where'd they go? Now, they did things for the Lord, but my point is this. Who is a prominent figure in the early portion of the book of Acts? I'll tell you who it is. It's Peter. Peter even <laughs> was crucified during the days of Nero. Can you imagine that? Do you know why they martyred the, 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 Christian, the Christians in the early church? Here's why. Because they refused to deny their faith. They would say to you, hey, if you recant Christ, if you say you don't believe, hey, you can go scot-free. Can you imagine in the days of Nero that took the life of Paul and, and Peter, that they came to Peter and said to him, listen, if you say you didn't know him, 
we'll let you go free. You don't think Peter's mind went back to that night he was warming his hands by the fire and said, I didn't know him, and he caught the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ? You don't think that didn't go through his mind thinking, I'm not doing that again. There's no way I'm doing that again. My God saved me. My God restored me, and I'm going I'm to stand firm until the end. Peter refused to be crucified straight up. They actually crucified him upside down because here's how he said it. He says, I'm not worthy to be crucified as my Lord was crucified. Hang me upside down. God used a man that was away from him in a pretty serious way, denying him, cursing and doing all this once he was, was restored to doing great and wonderful things for him. But it all boils down to restoration. Peter had the desire to be restored because God wanted to restore him. You may be here today and say, you know what, I wasted a lot of my life. I just didn't serve the Lord. I was saved and I'm out doing this and out doing that and out doing this and, 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 and I don't know how God can use me. Stop thinking that way. You can get right with God. God can use you in a, in a way above your imagination, exceeding abundantly above all that you ask or think. You may have done some things and said, God can't forgive me. I, I don't know how he can. I'm so embarrassed. I'm so ashamed. Hey, come to God. He'll forgive you. He'll restore you and he'll use you again for his glory. But the point is this. You have to want it. He's there saying, come. I'm waiting. I'll use you. I'll bless you. I'll, I'll forgive you. There's, there's no problem on my end. You don't know what she did to me, and what she said to me, and what this and that. Do you know I found that this is just an observation. I have no true statistics for this. But I have found from observation that the, the people that God uses the greatest in a church are the people that frequent the altar the most. I've found that uncanny connection there. Now, I'm not saying if you're elderly, you can't come. I understand that that happens. You got bad knees, and I get that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the ones God uses. You know why? You know why so? Because they're so sensitive to their sin. They're so concerned. Lord, I want, yes, I'm a soul winner, but I want to be a better soul winner. Yes, Lord, I pray. I want to pray better, more. Yes, Lord, I read my Bible, but I want to read my Bible more. Uh, Lord, help me uh, with my tongue in my house. Uh, help me with the way I treat people. Help me at work uh, to work hard and be a good testimony. They come and they ask God. You know what God does? He restores them. You know, preacher, I do that, and then I go back and I do the same thing again. Yeah, join the club. What do you do? Come back again. Get restoration. There's no little number that, uh, you know, you get to and it's full and you can't be restored anymore. He'll do it again and again and again and again. But it starts with you and me. We have to desire to be restored. Do you desire it today? I hope so. Let's pray together.